and I want to welcome you to the truth about neck and headache pain. So let me share my screen so you can see this. I think you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, the lead slide, which says the truth about neck and headache pain. My name is Troy Vandermolen. I'm a doctor of physical therapy. Um, and I want you to know that I do want to be interactive here tonight. So here's how you can do that. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat icon like that. If you click on that chat icon, a little box will open up. You can type in that box. Anything that you type in there, I'll be able to see. So if you have questions, please do that. Ask those questions of me. In an effort to be interactive, I'm going to have a couple poll questions tonight. Please understand that I cannot see your answers. I see general answers, but I don't see individual answers. So I encourage you to answer those poll questions. And then at the end of tonight, I will give you some direct contact information. I'll give you my direct email, my direct cell phone number, so that if you have, if you have questions that do not get answered tonight, um, we'll, you'll have an opportunity to, to reach out that way. Uh, I have had a couple people reach out ahead of time. Someone was asking about whether ice or heat uh, is a better thing to use. Uh, another one asking about what they can do to reduce or prevent uh, worsening of arthritis. Uh, we'll definitely talk about that last item. If I forget that previous item, I think you'll get to the end step, I understand. Ice and heat, just like any local treatment, uh, is a way to minimize discomfort. In, in some cases, ice can be better for someone and heat can be better for others. But we're going to go beyond just how to deal with this discomfort. We're going to talk about how to get to the root of the problem so you can cut it off at its knees. I think that's the difference about what you're gonna to hear tonight and what you hear uh, during most of these presentations. Just a wee little bit of introduction. Um, you're gonna learn stuff from me tonight that I've learned in 24 years as a physical therapist. And that's kind of humbling. It doesn't seem like I've been doing it this long. Um, I'm honored to say I'm a graduate of the University of Iowa Physical Therapy Program, an excellent program that consistently gets ranked in the top two or three across the country by independent uh, assessors of those kind of things. And I, I feel very proud of the fact that I got to experience that. But the reality is uh, there is no substitute for 24 years of experience. I'm gonna teach you stuff that I really didn't learn that much in PT school. You learn the basics and how to, um, how to go about the process of assessing someone, but you're gonna to learn tonight about Kind of the secrets that I've learned through 24 years of doing this too. I'm a part of a group called Kinetic Edge Physical Therapy. We've been around for 22 plus years. Uh, we have eight clinics in Central and South Central Iowa. Uh, neck issues are a really common thing. Lower back pain is the most common thing that we help people with, but neck and shoulder pain uh, are number two. In fact, in our seven locations, we just opened our eight a couple months ago, but in our seven locations, I did a little analysis and found that about um, over the past three years, we've done about 20, almost 25,000 sessions with people dealing with neck and headache pain. And so I guess that's encouragement to you to know that you are not alone. This is something that a lot of people deal with. And that's also an encouragement to you because we've got a lot of experience dealing with this. So that experience is going to be helpful to you as we move forward tonight. I want you to understand that this uh, specific presentation is made for certain people. And so this presentation is for you. If you're feeling like this neck pain, this headache issue, uh, either or, or both, is becoming a bigger monster as time goes by. Most people that uh, deal with this tell me, you know, early on it was a small problem. I didn't like it, uh, but it wasn't terribly bad. It would come and it would go. But almost everyone tells me that as time goes by, it gets worse. It gets more frequent. It gets more intense and the duration tends to get worse when we exacerbate it. That's the reality of most musculoskeletal issues. They don't tend to get better over time. They tend to slowly get worse. And as a result, people stop doing things that they love to do for fear of hurting themselves worse. Uh, they find themselves becoming um, prematurely dependent upon others and would like to maintain their dependence as much as possible. Sleeping can be really difficult for people who deal with neck pain. And if you're just tired of having pain rule your life and you want to rule it better, this is for you. And I ultimately want you to be able to do this without having to depend upon medications, injections, or surgeries. Okay. Now, I wish I could tell you there was a quick fix for this problem. I, believe me, I do. Uh, and I know that if you go online and you search solutions for neck pain, there will be a lot of people saying there are get fixed quick kind of solutions. Uh, my experience tells me that isn't really um, the 
case. There are some things that can give you some temporary pain relief, but it's not getting to the root of the problem. It's just dealing with the symptom, not the root of the problem. And so if, uh, if you're just looking to mask your symptoms and not getting to the root of the symptoms, the root of the issue, this is probably not the place for you to be. Uh, but if you wanna understand it at the root and be empowered with things you can do to um, really attack it and get long-term benefit, then this is the right place uh, for you to be. Uh, I'm gonna quickly fold through these. I want you to uh, exercise that interactive tool called the chat button right now. And I want you to answer these questions. So literally open it up, get ready to type. You tell me in the last couple of weeks, is there an activity, a, a position, something that you've done that's the most difficult for you because of your neck pain? What, what is the, what's it making it difficult for you to do? What's caused the most discomfort in the neck or headache pain over the past couple of weeks? And then tell me, how high does that pain get on the one to 10 scale? Now, I have a lot of people over the years that have told me I have a 14 out of 10 pain. Um, I understand what they're saying, but there's no such thing. 10 is get me to the emergency room now kind of pain. So how high does your pain get when you really work it up? And then tell me how long have you been experiencing it? Have you been dealing with it for days, weeks, months, or years? Now I'm asking you those questions, asking for some real responses here, so don't be shy. Um, I'm asking them because your answer will tell me if this is something I can help you with, okay? These are questions that we ask people that come into the clinic all the time because depending upon their response, it will help us understand if what we can do is gonna be beneficial for you, okay? We got a shy group tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, we got someone talking now, I like it. So Ellen says it's on the side of the neck. Uh, when she wakes up in particular, it's problematic. And it's about a five out of 10. She fell over years ago, so she had an incident but it's continuing. Okay, Ellen, it's very interesting. Amy said sleeping is difficult too, and about a five, it's off and on for years. Well, I'm glad it's not on, on, on all the time, that it's off and on. That's a really good thing. Um, in fact, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. We know that if your pain comes on because of a particular activity or is associated with a specific activity, believe it or not, that's actually good news. Because if you have pain that is unremitting, we're concerned about more uh, nefarious issues going on. Um, nighttime pain, worsening pain as a result um, that isn't influenced by position or posture is a, uh, a situation you probably don't want to have. Uh, Jackie says sleep, uh, sleep's uncomfortable, I'm assuming you're saying. Again, it can get up to an aim. It's been years on and off. Uh, Dale Watson's using a word we're going to use in a little bit here. He has some stenosis issues. We're going to talk exactly about that tonight, Dale. It varies, but can get up to a six and over several years. Okay, good, we're getting some good interaction here. So the reason I'm asking these questions is because most people are gonna tell me there's something that I do that can make it feel worse. And again, it sounds funny, but when you tell me there's something that brings it on, I say, okay, that's good. Because we know that if it's reproducible with something, it's probably also reducible with something as well. So I've written several things down here that are common complaints that I hear amongst people that deal with neck and headache pain. Reading, move, specific movements, uh, sitting in a chair in the car, working at a computer, looking up, um, sleeping, those kind of things. Those are really common positions that can be problematic if you have what we call mechanical pain. And mechanical pain says mechanically there's something that puts pressure or tension on the tissue that makes it hurt and something else will reduce that pressure or tension and make it feel, relatively speaking, better. That is not a bad thing. As we move forward and talk a little more in depth about that, I wanna tell you a little bit about two types of trauma. There are two distinctly different types of trauma. One's called acute, another's called cumulative. I'm gonna graph what each of these looks like. So my graph here has tissue damage severity over time. When you have acute trauma, acute trauma is the result of one thing. You did this and it made it bad. So you think about with acute trauma, we think about uh, traumas like motor vehicle accidents or falls that cause something to get stressed, strained or fractured, um, slips, trips and falls, those kind of things. That's sudden tissue damage 
And as time goes by, it gets better. We go through a healing process. Fortunately, we're created that we heal. And in many cases, it gets better to the point where it gets below the symptom threshold again, and we do pretty well. In most cases, acute trauma, things that are caused by one incident, results in us getting better as time goes by. In fact, naturally, the body will get better. Now, if you have a significant enough acute trauma, it may not get below that symptom threshold. It might be a lifelong issue. Sometimes people deal deal with that, but I would argue that the prevalence of that trauma that continues to cause pain, even though it's brought on by one incident, two things are probably happening. Number one, there was probably some cumulative trauma happening beneath the surface before that incident. And number two, there's probably continued cumulative trauma that's acting on that area that was influenced negatively with that one acute incident. So cumulative trauma looks like this, a lot different. And what we're seeing here is this ramps up as something that could take months or even years to develop. In fact, the early stages, there are things happening, changes occurring in that tissue that we don't even know about because it's below the symptom threshold. With people like this that can't pinpoint it to a specific incident, they'll usually say at some point in time, well, now I feel something, I don't know why, I'm not doing anything different than normal, but they'll usually say at the start, that's not so bad. In fact, what I said earlier, frequency is not bad, intensity is not bad, duration is short. But if they continue to do the same things, they get exposed to the same lower levels of stress, the body gets worse as time goes by and frequency, intensity, and duration slowly worsens as well. You see those two buckets there, the one above the symptom threshold, it's spilling out, the one below, it just got a little bucket. Uh, This is a good analogy that helps people understand cumulative trauma. Cumulative trauma is slow and insidious, but it's very predictable, okay? So I've been a physical therapist now for 24 years, and I just turned 49, so about half my life. Uh, Being a physical therapist is great because you get to see so many different things and you get to know so many different people. It is not physically challenging Sometimes mobilizing someone that's really big, a, a, a leg or something like that could be difficult, but compared to a lot of work, it's not physically challenging. Uh, even so, at 49, at the end of the week, I have more fatigue today than I did when I was 24 years and entering uh, the workforce. And so fatigue is the first sign that the body is changing. And eventually we all experience that. That's a normal part of aging. That being uh, the case, we tend to ignore it. And we just keep doing stuff. Okay, we don't want to be a squeaky wheel, so we just keep doing the same stuff. And eventually, for many people, that fatigue will eventually turn into stiffness and soreness. Does it sound familiar to anyone out there tonight? Um, we just don't feel as young as we used to. It uh, takes a little bit longer to get warmed up when we do more uh, physically demanding activities. We need more recovery time after a physically demanding activity. Think about it, if you're in your 50s or 60s, the last time you had to paint a wall for a while, looking up, using your hand above there. You remember how that made you feel different than when you were 20 years old and did the same kind of activities? You likely experienced some stiffness and soreness for days after that incident. That was a little bit different than just pain. But again, we don't like to be squeaky wheels. We just keep going and we ignore it, we keep pushing. And unfortunately, the next step beyond that is we really hurt. It's not just stiff and sore anymore, it hurts. And we're close to this overflow, which is now we're dealing with tissue injury issues that are gonna require time, energy, and probably money to get better again, okay? So this is what cumulative trauma looks like. What I'm gonna teach you tonight is how to build a bigger bucket, how to open up the valve, how to prevent this water from overflowing as best you can. The reality is most of you, even if you had an instant that you could say, this happened and I had a neck problem because of that, you probably have cumulative issues at play here too. And so even those people will tell me, yeah, my pain frequency, my pain intensity, the duration of my pain does continue to slowly get worse and it's frustrating. And when we hurt more, we move less. When we move less, our overall health is negatively impacted. So what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight, the process I'm gonna go through is all about efficient movement. When we move efficiently, we put equal stress on a bunch of body parts. And I will tell you, if your neck is hurting and you have headache issues, it's very likely that you have additional stress acting upon your neck because something somewhere or some things somewhere are not doing their job 
as efficiently as possible. So here's a truth I want you to understand. I think you will easily understand this. We are most capable of influencing the people closest to us. And if I'm a, being a good person, I will have a positive influence on those people around me. If I'm a negative influence, if I'm uh, not a good person, I'm going to negatively influence those people closest to me. So if your neck hurts, you need to ask what around this area is having a negative influence on that. So let me give you another analogy of this. Think about an assembly line, okay? And coming down the assembly line is a product. And let's say we got three people, A, B, and C, all doing a little work on this product before it sinks, goes further down the line and gets uh, boxed up and shipped out. Okay, person A does a third, person B does a third, person C does a third, and on it goes. They're sharing the work. What would happen if person B decided, I'm not going to do my job? Okay, now initially it would be annoying. The people would give them dirty looks, but they'd keep going and they could do it. But day in and day out over weeks, months, and years, if person B continues to take a in-work sabbatical, and the other two have to pick up the slack, have to do more to compensate. If they bear, carry an additional load because of what person B is not doing, who's gonna suffer, okay? Now, if I was the supervisor and I saw these two people and it was clear they were hurting, and if I went up and said, boy, I'm gonna rub your shoulders, I'm gonna give you a massage, how about taking this pill? Um, you need to learn how to manage your stress better. Let's teach you about that. And they'd say, well, you know, the, all those things, they're good tools, but you're not getting to the root of the problem. And I'd say, what do you mean? And they'd say, person B, get that person to do the job and I don't have to do as much. So this is what being a good physical therapist is all about. Finding out which part or parts are not doing the work and as a result are adding stress to other parts. So I will tell you, if you have neck and headache pain, you may not have a neck problem. You might have an other problem that's manifesting with additional stress on the neck that's crying out for help, okay? Here's the good news. If you learn to move efficiently, you will move better and you will move more often. Uh, our top six healthcare spends in America make up 86% of healthcare costs in America. Most of them are influenced by posit positively by good movement. So I've written them down there, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, depression, even some cancers, which is the sixth out of six, in addition to musculoskeletal issues. All of these things are positively influenced by moving efficiently, okay? Now, I don't know if you've seen this, but in my line of work, I've seen way too many 60-year-old, 80-year-olds. What do I mean by that? Well, chronologically, they've lived on this earth from the time of their birth for 60 years, but because of the way that they've moved, the stresses that they put on their body, they are actually in real age about 80 years old, okay? That's also an opportunity. We can take stress off that tissue. And I'm not telling you you do that, snap, crackle, pop, you're gonna feel like $100 million again. It's not a um, quick fix solution. But if you do the right things to take stress off that tissue, your pain frequency, intensity, and duration will get better. And in some cases, it does eliminate that pain, but it will not happen unless you get to the source of the problem. Unfortunately, people do not respond appropriately to problems. Okay, right now I'm sitting in a house that was built in 1915. I'm in the attic level, the oldest part of the house. Over there is a new part of the house. We've got lots of shingles covering this thing and those shingles have not been replaced for a long time. Several years ago, we bought this house the insurance adjuster came over and said, yeah, we'll insure you, but we're not gonna insure these shingles. Okay, so I'm getting them fixed in the spring. I've waited too long. If I continue to ignore this problem, I would end up spending more money dealing with the ramifications of that. Still, I've not fixed that problem yet. I'm getting them in the spring, okay? But I acted like most of all of us act. When we see a problem and it's not a big deal, it's not creating many issues, we tend to ignore it. This is the single biggest mistake that most people make. They just, they don't wanna be the squeaky wheel. Uh, and, and during this phase, the ignoring it phase, sometimes it sounds like excuses. So I'll tell you three, uh, two or three excuses I hear all the time. Tell me if you've used these. I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm no spring chicken, right? What do I expect? How about this one? Uh, 
my mom had neck and headache problems. It's probably genetic. I'm not sure there's anything I can do about that. Okay? Those are really common excuses. And, and believe me, I can understand. This is a way to mentally cope with something that you feel like you don't have any control over. So I understand why people do that, but I will tell you those things cause us to uh, ignore the problem in a, in a sense so that we do not get to the, the problem. Now, eventually, and you might be in this group now because you're listening to me tonight, uh, eventually we learn we can't ignore it anymore. It's getting worse. I got to do something about this. And if you go into Google and you search for solutions to neck pain, and again, you're going to find there's a bunch of people that want to take your money. It's a multi-billion dollar industry dealing with neck and headache pains. That's for sure. I cannot think of one situation where those solutions were not simply altering or masking the problem. In fact, I'm going to raise my hand and apologize to you. As a part of the medical establishment, much of what we do in physical therapy, much of what um, medical doctors do, uh, do not really get to the root of the problem. They just mask the problem. Medications, injections, and surgeries are the three most common treatment for musculoskeletal issues, none of which get to the root of the problem. So my goal tonight is to help you understand that there's a way to get to the root of the problem. And if you do that, you don't need all these other things that uh, cost a lot of money and at best give you temporary symptom relief. We want to get to the root of the problem. And if we're going to do that, we have to understand this key point, okay? Uh, you don't look at the side of your neck and see a dial on the side of your neck there that says, oh, look at that. I'm low on ibuprofen. I better take an anti-inflammatory, right? That is a way of dealing with a uh, mechanical issue using a medical approach. I'm going to tell you this, these musculoskeletal issues, in most cases, are medical issues at all. They're movement issues, okay? So if you try to deal with a mechanical issue with a chemistry treatment, you're only going to get temporary symptom relief at best. You're not getting to the root of the problem. Movement-based issues need movement-based solutions from movement-based experts. I want to tell you a little story about one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis. But before I do that, let me tell you a little bit. I'm not going to go deep into the weeds with this information, but I want you to understand that no matter what kind of injury you experience, on the outside or on the inside, the body will go through a natural healing process, and it has four phases. Look at phase two there. From day three to about the end of week three, generally, we have a phase called the inflammation phase right? You've heard of that. What do we do when we know that we have inflammation going on? Well, I better take an anti-inflammatory, right? Ibuprofen, that's an anti-inflammatory over the counter. There are lots of prescription anti-inflammatories as well. Well, what are we doing then? If we take an anti-inflammatory, we're stopping the inflammation process. But the inflammation process is necessary because it leads to phases three and four where we get more proliferation of the blood vessels to that tissue and it matures and that tissue gets everything it needs to stay healthy. Okay, think about a heart attack, right? The heart muscle is the most important muscle in the human body. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. But if we get something that blocks a major artery, that artery is feeding that heart muscle with the nutrients necessary to stay alive and so it can continue to pump. And if we don't get good blood flow, through that artery to the heart muscle, bad things can happen. Now in your neck, it's not as um, life altering, at least in terms of life or death situations what the heart muscle is. But tissues that don't get blood flow are the tissues that succumb to time. So how does this play into C.S. Lewis? Well, if you don't know C.S. Lewis, he has been gone for a long time. I think he wrote most of his stuff in the 40s and 50s maybe into the late 30s, even prior to that. He was a contemporary to J.R.R. Tolkien. If you liked the uh, Chronicles of Narnia and those stories, you'll, you'll recognize uh, C.S. Lewis maybe too. During World War II, he wrote an essay called Miracles. And I've got a quote directly from that essay. In it, C.S. Lewis says, the magic is not in the medicine, it's in the patient's body. What the treatment does, or I'm gonna add, what good and successful treatment does is that it stimulates nature's functions or it removes a hindrance. Now let's look at that um, 
short excerpts from miracles through the lens of an anti-inflammatory. Think of anti-inflammatory as the treatment. Is it stimulating nature's functions? No, it's not. It's stopping the inflammatory process, which is a part of the way we're designed to heal. Is it removing a hindrance? No, it's not. It's adding a hindrance. Okay, so I will tell you a little bit of uh, ibuprofen use every now and then. I'm not going to say it's a bad thing, but doing it with consistency is, I would say, absolutely fool's gold in most cases. Okay, we need to allow the body to go through the healing process. We need that tissue to get blood flow through this development uh, of blood vasculature, which is a the end result of a good healing process. Now, before we talk about the types of neck pain, the causes of those neck pain issues, and then what successful treatment looks like, I wanna tell you about Nathan. So I, I saw Nathan uh, late in his high school years. He'd been dealing with two years of neck pain that had developed pretty significant migraines. He hated riding in cars because the bouncing and the postures in the car that made his migraines worse. At least he called them migraines. They really weren't migraines because they were the result of specific postures and positions. He had doctored with a lot of different um, general practice doctors and specialists, headache specialists. He'd done everything you'd expect with medications, local injections, more medications, and just wasn't able to find the thing that was a solution to him. Uh, his studies were difficult. His social life was negatively impacted. And he was frankly becoming anxious, depressed, and, and felt shame for what he was experiencing, thankfully, or un unfortunately. But thankfully, Despite being very skeptical, he followed the lead of one of his physicians and came and saw us at Kinetic Edge. And so when he came in, I talked to him, asked questions, listened to his story, which I think is really important, then just did some basic assessments. And we actually found that his neck issues that elicited headache responses, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, were not neck issues. It was really uh, related to hip issues. The root problem was how he moved through his hips. So I'm not gonna go into that in detail now, I will in just a little bit. But I'm gonna use this as a way to tell you my story about why we teach this stuff. Uh, I have three close friends that are medical doctors. Two of them are family practice doctors, one's an uh, ER physician. Um, great people, unbelievable knowledge about the human body. Um, I wouldn't want to uh, do a trivial pursuit human body edition with them because they know too much. Uh, the number two reason though, that people go see their doctors are a complaint that it hurts when I move, something musculoskeletal. And these doctors themselves tell me, I don't know how to deal with that stuff. We weren't trained to deal with this kind of stuff. And so often what happens, they don't know what to do. So they're gonna do one of three things. They're gonna give you medications. Um, if the medications work, but not really, not terribly long, then they'll probably do a diagnostic test and eventually they might refer you on to a specialist. Um, and none of that is getting them, in most cases, to where they need to go to really find and fix the root cause of the problem. Last year in 2019, one medication, um, opiates or narcotics, um, resulted in 70,000 Americans accidentally overdosing. Now, that wasn't all because of prescription medications. Many were. But heroin, for example, um, uh, overdosing on heroin, that's a, that's a narcotic. That's, a, that's an opioid. So that contributes to that uh, statistic as well. Um, last several years, we've made it a huge emphasis to get the word out about the dangers of these things, um, but yet it continues to be a problem. In fact, this year, unfortunately, one of the unintended consequences of COVID and people being separated from each other is that we're hearing stories about more people accidentally overdosing. About seven or eight years ago, maybe a little bit longer now, I had a 24-year-old guy, uh, chronic back pain, um, and it was a real issue. He couldn't manage the pain. And he, as, as he was doing physical therapy, he was also taking narcotics. And uh, he didn't show up for therapy one day. And I tried calling on him. And the long story short is he accidentally overdosed. Narcotics, uh, opiates will slow your respiration down. And the people that die, uh, unfortunately, as a result of overdosing, are usually just taking more medication to feel better, get rid of some of that pain, but it stops their respiration while they sleep. So, this is when I became committed to telling more people this story. We need to stop using medications that don't get to the root of the problem. In this case, that could be exceptionally dangerous, can kill people. Um, 
instead of getting to a place that can actually help them get to the root of the problem, surgery prevalence is going way up. In the last 10 years, it's more than double for this issue. We are not treating this like a mechanical issue. We're treating it like a medical issue. And we are failing with that. So this is an article from a couple months ago, three months ago, U.S. overdose deaths are rising amid the coronavirus pandemic. We need to stop depending upon these medications that give us false hope, but don't get to the root of the problem. We need to find a way to get to the root of the problem. We need to stop being insane and follow Albert Einstein's recommendation. All right, so let's talk about these three things. Let's start by talking a little bit about movement design of your neck or the cervical spine. All body parts move three-dimensionally. So what do we mean by that? Well, next rotate, right? Right rotation, left rotation. That's movement in the transverse plane. Flexion and extension, okay? That's movement in the sagittal plane. And then we got side bend left and right. That's movement in the frontal plane. Well, let's look at the cervical spine. It moves a lot in a lot of different directions. It flexes and extends about 45 in each direction. Under normal circumstances, you rotate in uh, 80 degrees, both to the left and to the right. And we side bend about 45 degrees. So we can see we are made primarily to rotate at the cervical spine, but we have lots of other movements in the other two uh, secondary and tertiary planes of movement in the cervical spine. But what can happen that causes us to add additional stress to that tissue. We're gonna talk about that in just a little bit. Let's do that in the, um, uh, looking through the lens of three types of neck pain and headache issues. Uh, these are descriptions or diagnosis. We are not at this point talking yet about the cause because one cause can result in a disc bulge for someone, suboccipital headaches in other people and arthritic problems in a third person. So the cause is the most important thing to know. But we're gonna talk about uh, the types first. Let me ask a poll question. Again, this is an encouragement to you. Oh, shoot, my polls are not working tonight. I didn't get that one launched. Sorry about that, less interaction tonight. Let's talk about disc bulges, okay? This is a change of the discs and a disc exists between each vertebral segment. We have seven cervical segments. So seven segments make up the neck or the cervical spine. Uh, you can see this disc has outer rings. And then when it starts to bulge, and then eventually if it gets larger and herniates, it's almost always moving back and to the left or back and to the right. Okay, so this is a bird's eye view, a transverse slice. So when we move forward, the, uh, the material in the middle it's a little simplistic. Some people call that like jelly in, in a jelly donut. Uh, think about the air in a balloon. You push on one side of the balloon, that air moves away from it, right? So in some respects, this is what happens when we have a disc herniation. It's herniated in the direction of these nerves. So when the nerve gets some pressure, we get pain, numbness, tingling going down the arm. Uh, depending upon which level it's at, will tell us how far down it moves the arm, which area of the arm. Now, this crab meat in the middle, this movable part, it's much more mobile when we're younger. And so disc bulge issues are the problem of younger people. So if you're with me tonight and you are not 35 years of age or younger, this is probably not you. Maybe one day it was you in the past, but now it is not you, okay? People that have this will tell me that coughing and sneezing is problematic usually looking down or looking away from the area of pain is going to create more pressure uh, of the disc material moving towards that nerve root. Um, here's the good news though, and I'm going to tell you lots of good news in the next several slides. There are more people that have disc bulges that do not know it because they have no pain than people that have disc bulges and experience pain with it, okay? MRI studies show that if you're 64 years or older, 69% of those people have a disc bulge and have no pain. So these are MRIs done of people that are experiencing no neck pain whatsoever. Almost seven out of 10 will have a disc bulge and they don't know it. So that's good news. And, and frankly, if you do have symptoms, that's uncomfortable. It's not fun whatsoever. I want to tell you though, it's not dangerous at all. If you start to have difficulty with grip strength, pinch strength, holding on to objects because you're getting weak, 
when it's not just a sensory issue, but it's affecting your ability to use the muscle. It creates a motor change. That's a more significant issue that definitely needs more emergency attention, okay? But if you're just dealing with pain, numbness, and tingling, as uncomfortable as that can be, you're in no danger of lifelong functional issues as a result of that. Here's some more good news. These are all images uh, taking of people of various age categories that have no neck pain. And so we're seeing lots of disc degeneration, lots of disc bulging, disc protrusions, fissures of the annula, which is the, the rings on the outside, the generation of this facet joint right here. All these things are exceptionally common. They get more common as we get older, but most people that have these issues experience no pain. So I'm telling you this because many people will say, I have pain, I did an MRI, we found a problem, I need to have a surgery to get rid of that problem. I'm gonna tell you, it's very likely you had that problem before you had symptoms. So why would you go get rid of that problem if it existed before and was not giving you symptoms? Okay, I think that's important to know. We'll talk a little more detail about that in a little bit. So I'll drive that home point, uh, point home again too. Now, Dale, you said you had stenosis. That's just a fancy name for arthritis. Uh, arthritis is normal as well. Uh, people that have arthritis, because of changes in the tissue around the area where that nerve root exits. We can get um, things that grow on there, osteophytes or the disc starts to degenerate and move in that direction. It can put pressure on that nerve root and it can feel very much like a bulging disc, but it's not. Uh, this is generally people that are older than age 35. So people that were younger and had issues might've started as a bulging disc, which is a more dynamic issue and turn into an arthritic problem, okay? And it is normal to lose disc space as we age. Um, the good news is that opening and closing of the foramen through which that nerve root exits, it's dynamic. And so we can find ways to take pressure or tension away from that tissue. The tissue is just giving you uh, an alert. It's kind of like a light going on in the dashboard of your car, right? Um, hey, help me here. I'm, I'm giving you a sign that something needs to be dealt with. Here's an artist's rendering of some changes. There's where osteophytes are growing, changes to that joint. It's called the facet joint. Um, we have one on the right and the left side between each and every segment in our spine. The degeneration that's happening at the disc itself is causing that disc space to narrow. All of that has the potential of acting upon that nerve root as it exits from the spine, okay? So think about the exit on my right side between say five and six. If I bend towards that thing, it'll probably close it down, right? If I bend away, it'll open it up. Okay, so there are always ways to add pressure or remove pressure using movements. Let me show you this. This is actually showing movement at the lumbar spine, but the cervical spine is very, very similar. I want you to notice as this thing zooms in, how when the spine moves, the hole closes and opens. So look. Backwards bending, it closes. Forward bending, it opens it up, okay? Side bend towards, it will show in a moment here. That's gonna close it down. You'll see that right here, okay? Side bend away, it's gonna open it up again. That nerve's gonna have less pressure. Now it's harder to see, this angle is not good, but when we rotate to the left, that left side actually opens up. When we rotate to the right, that left side actually closes down a little bit, okay? So the point I'm trying to make is this. Sometimes we can fix it with movement. Even more foundational or elementary to that is, we need to ask the question, why is that thing getting pressure? Is there something that's causing it to move in a way that it's adding pressure, movement pressure to that tissue, okay? Finally, let's talk a little bit about suboccipital issues that lead to headaches. So this area of our um, head, our, our, our skull, is called the occiput. When we talk about suboccipital, we're talking about underneath. Submarine is underneath the water, right? This is suboccipital. There are muscles traveling through here. And through those muscles come these nerves that travel up into the scalp. The gentleman that I saw, the high school age kid that did really well once we found the root of his problem, had lots of tightness in these muscles, and those muscles would put pressure on the nerves and gave him headache issues 
that were very closely related to certain postures that he was in. This almost never causes numbness, tingling, and pain into the arm. It's, it's local to the neck and head. Usually increases with activity. End of the day is difficult. And most people can touch those muscles in the neck and just tell they're really tight. And it sometimes can elicit some pain traveling to the scalp from that area. And this affects people of all ages, young and old, uh, healthy and unhealthy. And in most cases, it's not going to show up when you do an MRI. So again, we can see all these muscles. You can see how those nerves travel to that muscle. I want to find out why those muscles are tight. In most cases, there is a the ideal and um, preferred posture of the head and neck is not what it should be when people experience this, okay? Just remember though, if you've had an MRI or an X-ray and you've been told, oh man, you've got the neck of a 90 year old, I'm gonna tell you very kindly, who cares? Lots of people do and they don't deal, more people have that and don't deal with pain. Let's find a way to take stress off that tissue and you will feel better. Your pain frequency, intensity, and duration will go down. All right, so let's talk about the cause, the true cause of these issues. And again, I will repeat, some of you may have had an acute incident. You maybe were in a motor vehicle accident or had a fall, something like that. Um, that was certainly something that exacerbated or added sudden um, damage to particular tissues in the neck. But even prior to that, you probably had cumulative changes occurring. And since that time, if you had postural issues or something going on somewhere throughout the kinetic chain that didn't give you problems in the past, now with the incident that occurred, it is giving you problems. So we still need to find the root movement issue at play here. And we're gonna find that in most cases, one or more of these things are gonna be found in people with headache and neck pain. Hip issues, thoracic spine issues, or even foot and ankle issues in some cases. I will tell you, thoracic spine issues are probably the number one primary cause. Hip issues are a close second. Foot and ankle issues can be the, uh, a cause, but they are, are less likely to be the root cause. Let me talk a little bit about this, okay? Again, I told you that we move three-dimensionally. Every part is made to move rotation right and left, flexion, up and down, side bend left and right. And every part has to have a balance between mobility and stability. It's not good when something's way too mobile and doesn't have enough stability. It's not good when something is way too stable and doesn't have enough mobility. So in our clinic, we talk a lot about the Goldilocks principle. You remember that, uh, that tale? Um, Goldilocks went in and she went on Papa's bed too hard, Mama's bed, too soft, baby's bed, just right, right? The porridge, too hot, too cold, just right. So what we need in your body are a bunch of parts just right. Not too much of one thing, not too much of the other, but we want a balance between mobility and stability. The key to getting rid of your neck pain and reducing frequency, intensity, and duration, getting to the root of the problem is to find areas that don't have a balance between mobility and stability, okay? So how about the hips? So in uh, the young um, teenager's issue I was telling you about, he had really tight hamstrings. So the hamstrings start on the sitting bone, travel down to the back of the knee. And when they're tight, you can see how that would pull that pelvis down and back. And that leads to flexion of the spine, thoracic kyphosis and a forward head position. When we have a forward head position, the body tries to find a balance there, but that creates flexion up the lower part of the neck, extension at the upper part of the neck, and those muscles are in a shortened position back there. And so his headache actually was the net result of lots of things that changed, but the origin was due to a hip mobility problem, okay? Now, uh, I, I took out this slide. In some cases, people have a tightness that's a problem. And so that can be related to hamstring tightness. Ladies oftentimes will get hip flexor tightness and that gives them um, a forward pelvis and an increased arch in their lower back. Sometimes it's a weakness issue where the hips move too much and they're not supported well by good core strength or gluteal strength. That's actually in the older population equally as common as a tightness related issue. But if you've had headache and neck pain issues and you've not had someone assess how well your hips move, 
in all three planes and all six directions of movement, we, it's very possible and maybe likely that a key integral part of the movement chain that's contributing to stress elsewhere up the kinetic chain in the neck area has been ignored, okay? What about thoracic spine, okay? The thoracic spine is connected by our rib cage. It's of our spinal um, segments, the least mobile part of the spine, uh, but it still has to move. And I see a lot of people that get kyphotic in the thoracic spine. And guess what? That same thing occurs that I was telling you about before. A little roundness here leads to this forward head posture, okay? And that creates pressure on joints of the neck. Um, that pressure, mechanical pressure, leads to this wear and tear phenomenon that gradually builds and puts pressure and can actually put pressure on both joints and the nerve and contribute to symptoms down the arm. Um, improving thoracic extension and thoracic rotation is really important. This is actually a really common problem with regard to shoulder pain too. So if you've had both neck and shoulder pain, it's probably a thoracic spine issue. Um, these people that have thoracic spine limitations usually or often will have neck and lower back issues too. It's a common denominator between those two parts. And so again, if you've had headache or neck issues and or, and someone has not looked to see how your thoracic spine moves, it's quite possible that something critical to you feeling and functioning well has been missed. In fact, the thoracic spine limitations are the most common. Now you can see how a foot issue, flat arch for example, can lead to changes all the way up the kinetic chain and influences knee posture and position and therefore wear and tear, hip, low back, thoracic spine, shoulder and neck related issues. There are compensations that occur all the way up the kinetic chain. And so in some cases, dealing with foot related issues is important. But I will say it again, if you've had neck issues and you haven't had someone assess how your hips move, how your thoracic spine moves and how your feet move, uh, it's likely that a critical component or possibly two components that would help you remove stress from your neck and reduce frequency, intensity, and duration of your symptoms has been ignored. All right, and so this leads us to the last part. In order to truly eliminate or reduce frequency, intensity, and duration of your pain and symptoms, you have to find the root cause. Now, the most common treatments, I've already said, medications, injections, and surgeries, they can make you feel better, but they're not getting to the root of the problem. These only mask the issues. We want to get to the root of the problem. That means someone needs to look at you as an individual, understand about how all these individual parts move, do we have a Goldilocks principle of each of these parts? Eventually, we need to do things that improve movement where you're tight, improve stability where you're weak, but eventually we need to put your foot on the ground. I'd say successful treatment does not end on the table. It ends with you getting back on your feet, making sure your ankles, knees, hips, thoracic spine, neck, shoulder, all that works well together. Okay, you've heard of dem bones, the Ezekiel uh, story and song. Uh, the knee bone's connected to the hip bone, the hip bone's connected to the backbone. This is what successful treatment is. Make sure each of those parts are equipped to do what they're designed to do. That's what successful treatment is all about. That's what C.S. Lewis told us, okay? So instead of this cumulative issue slowly getting worse and continuing to increase in frequency, intensity, and duration, drive it back down below that second threshold again. I'm going to point out that if you hurt, you've had an MRI or an x-ray and you've been told there's some bad stuff there. If you do this treatment and have success and you later took a picture of the picture, it's not going to look that different. It'll look like the majority of those people who have problems but have no pain whatsoever. And that's okay. If you move well and take stress off that tissue, that tissue is not going to give you the kind of symptoms that you're accustomed to. All right, so we've gone through a lot of stuff, folks. I really appreciate your attentiveness. You've done a great job tonight. Uh, I have overloaded with a lot of information. It's impossible for you to retain all of this. And honestly, in this format, even when we're doing it in person, in a big group, I cannot find each of your problems. We need to go one more step. Now, a lot of people will say knowledge is power. I've given you a lot of knowledge, but I don't think you have power yet 
because knowledge is only powerful if you can implement it. That's why the next step is necessary. We need you to understand what is the real problem. Is it a hip issue? Is it a thoracic spine issue? Is it a foot issue? Is it a combination of that thing? Is it other things? We need to look at the bigger picture and understand what's contributing to stress in your neck. And so that is what I'm gonna offer you by taking um, advantage of this free offer. So there's no cost, no obligations whatsoever. If you raise your hand tonight and say, yeah, I wanna do this, you can come in and spend 20 minutes with one of our neck pain experts. They'll ask you some questions and hear your story a little bit. And they'll do a brief assessment, looking at those three parts and some other things. And at the end of that 20 minutes, you'll say, okay, I know what type of pain I have. These are the likely contributors. And here's what a process to make that better would look like. And then the ball's in your court at that time. Ultimately, I want people to get to someone who can help them, truly getting to the root of the problem so they can stop wasting time, wasting money on things that at the best simply alter the problem. And at worst, um, make you worse in some cases, okay? Now this time it has a value. We're not charging you for that. Nationally, that 20 minutes costs about 150 bucks. We're not gonna charge you that. We want you to have this information. We're not gonna add another hurdle uh, to getting that information. But I can tell you, if you come in and you say, you know what, that was a waste of my time. Just tell us that. We will take $150 and we will give it to your favorite charity. So that's our guarantee to you. Uh, we love supporting charities. We do that as much as we possibly can. But I'm thankful to say in this case, we've never had someone come in and do this and say, well, that was a waste of my time. I want you to do that. Uh, you will find this is exceptionally valuable. At the very least, you'll have a written summary you can take with you from that appointment and say, I know what's going on. Here's the type of pain. Here are the true culprits. Here's the strategy to fix it. So if you want to take me up on that, I encourage you not to hesitate. You can either get your phone out uh, and open up the camera and put it on that QR code there and a, and a um, link will pop up. You can click that on your phone and it gets to the spot on our website. You just give us your name, email, and where you'd like to do the screen. We have eight locations. I'll tell you that in a little bit. Actually, the easier thing though would be to use that chat button again. So if you want to, just click on that chat button and say, yeah, I want to get signed up now. Uh, and that's actually a good time. In a couple, two, three weeks, we're going to get busy again. We got more people that are just starting their calendar year now, so we don't have as many people coming into the clinic. So you can take advantage of the fact that we have a little more free time now, and you can find a good convenient time that works for you to come in and spend some time. Now we have clinics in Ames, Waukee, Des Moines, uh, Newton, Colfax, Pella, Oskaloosa, and Centerville. So any of those eight locations that are most convenient you can work, um, we do online stuff too. So if you're not local to one of those locations or COVID is still something you're a little bit concerned about, we're doing everything that we need to to stay healthy. and been really healthy through all this thing. But I completely understand that. If you'd rather do it uh, online, we can do it that way too. Okay. As I said at the start, I want to be a resource for you no matter what. So here's my contact information. That gets to this. You can send me a text, you can call me, whatever you want to do. You are going to get an email here either later tonight or first thing tomorrow morning. I'll remind you there's going to be a link for this video so you can watch it again. Please consider sending that to friends and family that deal with these issues so that they can learn something to help them as well. Okay. On there will be a link that will take you to this spot on our website if you prefer to sign up that way. Uh, based upon the stream location, you'll get a call from somebody um, or an email from somebody uh, to set you up at an appointment with that. So that's an option too. Um, and that email too, if you don't have this written down, that you can just reply to that email and that will get to me. See more information coming through. Okay. Uh, let's see, Amy. Yes, in person, Oscar is very good. Amy, uh, our care coordinators there are Margie and Stacy. So tomorrow, either Margie or Stacy will give you a call and we will find a time that's convenient for you to get in and get the answers that you need. So again, I encourage any of you right now, if you want to just type that in right now. If you have other questions too, I'm gonna hang around for just a little bit here. I wanna make sure those questions get answered. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'll continue to record. If any of you have any questions or you wanna get signed up, let me know. And even if you're like, okay, I know I wanna do this, but I can't do it in the next week. Let us know now, we'll keep you on our list. We'll make sure that you get called 
again, I appreciate that you've given me an hour tonight. I think that's um, helpful for sharing some important information in a really efficient way. But I don't think I've helped you, honestly. I think I, we've only helped you once you know what your issue is. And there's only one way to do that. That's to actually spend time with one of our therapists. And it's a heck of a deal because it costs you nothing. So no excuses for you to continue to deal with that. Okay. Anyone have any questions? I'm happy to answer them. All right, well, do not hesitate to reach out. Use any of the ways that I've encouraged you to contact me with this. And uh, if you have questions that you want to ask me specifically about at any time, I'll be your resource for that. Thank you so much tonight uh, for spending the 55 minutes with me, it looks like. Um, I'm blessed that you would uh, find this important enough to give me your valuable time. So uh, I pray that you'll be safe in 2021, that we can all move forward and put COVID behind us here soon. Uh, stay healthy and be well. And please let us know if we can help you in any way. Dale, I will pursue an appointment through an email contact tomorrow. Okay, very great. Appreciate that, Dale. Pam, thank you. Appreciate your time.